fantastic. This is one of my favorite carols. So good. We've sung it already and we're going to sing it again. Um, but I don't know about you. When, it's, when you've got a favorite carol or a favorite song, sometimes you can reel it off without really thinking about the words that you're saying or singing. And as I've dug into this carol the last week or so, there's so much in it. There's so much depth that we're going to try and explore a little bit of today. For those who might be interested, this carol, O Come All Ye Faithful, was written probably in 1743, so just the other day, um, and it was written as, with the title, Adeste Fidelis, and the Latin scholars among us, and those who aren't Latin scholars can probably guess that that translates to, O Come All Ye Faithful. But actually, as this carol or hymn was sung, people did translate it in slightly different ways. So depending on the version, you could have sung, Come, faithful all, rejoice and sing. Ye faithful, approach ye. Be present, ye faithful. Approach, all ye faithful. Assemble, ye faithful. Draw near, all ye faithful. And by the kind of 19th century, the original four verses had been added to, and the carol was a lot longer than it was originally written. But at its heart, this carol is one big invitation into the Christmas story. It's that time of year, isn't it? We get invitations to things. We get invitations to maybe Christmas drinks, works do, dare I say it, Christmas parties, We get invitations to someone's house on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day or Boxing Day and you try and navigate that family dynamic of who's going where this year for Christmas. We we get lots of invitations and we as a church like to invite at Christmas time, don't we? You're invited to New Year's, we're invited to Christmas Eve. People were invited this week to Santa's Grotto that we've heard about. We like to invite people to things Just as a shameless plug, Christmas Eve, this Friday, there's still some space. So if you haven't booked in, do book in. Um, As Fuller said, either way, whatever it looks like, uh, we will be worshipping Jesus. But the first thing is, when we get an invite, what we want to know, isn't it? We want to know, what am I invited to? Well, let me read from Luke chapter 2. Probably a passage of scripture many of you will know. It's one I was forced to read every Christmas at the carol service. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant, come ye, O come ye to, where are we going? Bethlehem. What we're going to do? Come and adore him, born the king of angels. If this carol is an invitation to the Christmas story, the first verse is what we're invited to. We're invited to Bethlehem. We're invited to come and worship this child who's actually not just a child, but this is a a king. And we've probably heard the Christmas story many, many times before. But it's an amalgamation and a conversion of lots of different stories. Because God ordains this setting in this cradle, in this town of Bethlehem. Where Mary and Joseph, who have an angelic encounter, hear from God. And God says to Mary, you will bear the Son of God. And they travel because of this census that's been ordered by while Quirinius was governor of Syria. They travel to this town. And yet you've got these other visitors also joining towards this town, following a star in the sky or following the angelic voices. And they travel as well. And everything descends upon where the invitation is to Bethlehem. A baby is born. This is a big deal. A king is going to be born. 
And as we know, Mary and Joseph travel there and Jesus is born. And as we journey through this carol, we see that the invitation to Bethlehem isn't just to attend a place, but is to go and participate in that place. It's to bring something. It's to respond to something in that place of Bethlehem. And what is that? We'll sing to come, which means to approach. The invitation is to approach Jesus. We'll sing to behold, which means to look or gaze upon. The invitation is to look and gaze upon this beautiful child who has been born saviour of the world. The invitation is to sing. And in singing, we declare with our mouths what we believe in our heart. And the invitation is to adore, which means to worship, to love and to honour. When we receive an invitation, we've got the details. We know when it is. We know what we need to wear and all of that. And then we need to decide, what's my response? Like, am I going to RSVP? And I think pre-pandemic, there were two big questions that any of us asked when we got an invitation. And they were this, am I free? In other words, look at your diary, am I available? And two, do I want to go? And let's be honest, we've all been invited to things and we go, could really do with not going to that. But do I want to go? Am I willing? Okay. I think there's a third question that we now ask based upon our shared experiences of living in a pandemic world over the last couple of years. Am I free? Do I want to go? And what's the risk? Because I don't know about you, but I think we're, we're being conditioned to risk assess everything that we do. You know, maybe even today coming to church, you think, do I feel more at risk because of what's happening around us? Maybe to Christmas gatherings, or maybe you've got vulnerable friends and family, and you're thinking, what's the, the risk of me being in these different places? Maybe even today you've, you've stepped back a bit more when you're speaking to people. Because I think this shared experience is causing us to say, am I willing? Am I um, available? But actually, what's the, what's the risk? Whether we were previously risk-adverse, risk-aware, or even risky, I think they're the frames, they're the filters that we, we frame our response through. O oh, come, all ye faithful, invites you and I to come to worship Jesus. And I think we have to answer those same questions again. Am I free? In other words, am I available to worship? Do I want to? Am I willing to come and worship Jesus? And then also, actually, well, what's the risk? What would people think if I put my life on the line and say, I'm all in for Jesus? As we sing through this carol, we see different peoples and groups of people's responses to the invitation to come and worship. You see, when we sing in this place today and when we sing this carol later, we're not just doing it alone. We're not just doing it as people gathered in this room or online. We are joining with the faithful. True God of true God, light from light eternal. Lo, he abhors not the virgin's womb. Son of the Father, begotten, not created. And maybe you're thinking, what's this got to do with joining with the faithful? Surely these words that we sing in this carol are all about this baby being in very nature God. You know, what's it got to do about joining with the faithful? But I want to pause for a moment here and look at these words. Because these words weren't penned by John Francis Wade in 1743. He copied something else. These words are almost an exact copy of something written in 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea where a creed was written about what the church believed. And nearly every Christian and every church since has based its faith and its beliefs and its mission and its life as a church and a fellowship of believers upon the words of the Council of Nicaea. Here's what it says, an excerpt from the Nicaean Creed of 325 AD. You might recognize some of these words. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, 
the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. This really excites me, and you might find it geeky, but I think it's amazing that when we sing these words today, we are joining with a choir of believers in Jesus who have sung or said or declared or believed or celebrated these words as a basis of their faith for thousands and thousands of years. Millions and millions of Christians around the world stand on these words. What amazes me about that is someone could have trusted Jesus approximately 1,696 years ago and said and believed these very words about God that we stand and sing 19th of December 2021 and we're saying exactly the same thing. That amazes me because the thing is this, Jesus is not a trend. He doesn't sometimes say, this is who I am, and then say, well, actually, today I'm this. Jesus is not a trend. He hasn't come and gone. He is eternal, always, steadfast, certain. He does not change. And we declare today the exact same thing that these believers in Jesus were declaring thousands of years ago. I think that, that thrills my heart. It brings me hope. The additional line, not in the creed is a rather odd one that I never understood as a child. Lo, he abhors not the virgin's womb. I mean, what does that mean? But I suppose a better way to think about it is this. In that first Christmas, we find a scene that is unexpected. Unexpected of a king, anyway. The fact that Jesus, the Messiah, fulfilled all these prophecies, but yet was born to a virgin. Saw it fit that he might enter the world through a young maiden's womb, and he'd say, well, I'm God, but I'm coming in all humanity. I'm God, I'm light, I'm not made, but yet this is the vessel that I've chosen to make myself known. I think there's a beautiful picture in that, that God came in absolutely all godness, true God of true God, but he came in all humanity as well. And knowing God has been there, knows and sympathizes with our struggles and our weaknesses, but yet is still God in the midst of it all. So as we sing these words later, and I had to check that this verse was in the version we're going to sing, I encourage us to declare and believe with all our heart, like thousands of Christians, millions of Christians through the ages, the unshakable, unchangeable, uncreated, eternal God who came into earth and by doing so said, God is with us. Hey, I think we need to know and realize that we live still in uncertain times, but he is certain and he is with you and he is with us. He's a Messiah, was then, still is, and he wants us to respond to RSVP, to the invitation to come and adore him. And I believe that God is stirring something in some people's hearts today. To say, actually, I, I believe there is more to this Christmas story than perhaps I'd given it credit for. I believe that there's, uh, there's something in me that just knows there's a ring of truth about it. Why have people believed it for so many years? There's a ring of truth about it. And if that's you today, can I encourage you to respond to the invitation to Bethlehem's manger? We join with the faithful. And as we continue to sing this carol, we, you might sing some less known verses. There's loads of them. Here's a couple that I came across. You see, we join with the faithful, but we also join with the shepherds and the wise men as they came to worship Jesus. See how the shepherds summoned to his cradle, leaving their flocks drawn nigh to gaze. We too will tither, bend our hearts oblations, I'm sure we're all doing that. Luke 2, and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were terrified, 
But the angel said, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born. He's the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And we know, don't we, the shepherds responded and indeed they found Jesus. Last week, James spoke to them, to, spoke to us about a light in the sky, the first Noel and the wise men responding to that sign. And there's a verse about them as well. Lo, star-led chieftains, magi Christ-adoring, offer him incense, gold, and myrrh. We to the Christ child bring our hearts oblations. We'll come back to that word. Matthew 2. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You see, on that first Christmas, the most unlikely visitors came to this child. Shepherds from their fields and men, magi, maybe magicians or sorcerers from a distant land came to worship this child. And do you know... They may have been known as sinners. They may have been known as outcasts. But what do they both do? Both these groups of people approach. I think there's so much power in going like this and coming towards and approaching this child in Bethlehem. Don't miss the message of the shepherds and the magi. If such outcasts and sinners as them could fall down and worship this newborn, so can we all. I think that's a beautiful and stunning emblem announcing that everyone can approach him. Whatever our past, like he's not like Santa, he doesn't have a naughty and a nice list. Whatever our present, whatever our history, whatever our sin, our failings, our brokenness, we can all approach But reading these verses, it made me think, it's not just about whether we approach or not. It's also about how we approach Jesus. According to the scripture, the wise men were overjoyed. The shepherds were full of joy once they'd got over there um, being terrified. And then in that verse, both, both verses, we sung that word, or we said that word, oblations. Anyone know what it means? I didn't, I had to look it up, okay? But the word oblation is a term meaning something presented or offered to God. Another version of the shepherd's verse said it differently. It said, they bend their joyful footsteps. Bend their joyful footsteps. And when I heard this line, my mind went off on a tangent. You see, I quite like people watching. And I was reminded of a time when I was sat in a coffee shop by a busy high street, and I was sat in the window watching people walk by. And I don't know if you've ever done this before, maybe it's only me, but I think you can tell or assume or guess or maybe even judge how people are doing based upon their footsteps. Yeah? There was one guy and he was like this. And I thought, wow, he's, I mean, he's busy. There was someone else and I thought, he didn't look particularly joyful because he was like this kind of absolutely oblivious to what was going on in the world around him because he was worshipping his God, I mean, on his phone. (laughs) There was this other guy, and I, I don't know if you might resonate with this picture or you might have seen someone or know someone like this, but he just looked like he had the weight of the world upon his shoulders. And he, just by how he walked and carried himself, I thought... There's an absence of joy. I wonder what's going on in his, his life. Just, he had joyless footsteps. And then there were two groups of people I thought looked a bit different. There was one family, and they were kind of looking at each other, smiling, laughing. Obviously, I'm, I'm guessing, enjoying each other's company, jostling a bit, and looking like they wanted to spend time together. They had joyful footsteps. And then there was this one person, which is the reason I tell the story. Because I don't think I have ever seen anyone with more joyful footsteps than this guy. Because he was going down the high street like this. (laughs) He, he, He just loved life. Didn't speak to him. Don't know how he was doing. But he looked like his footsteps made him look like he was, he was joyful. 
I say that because as I was, and I really felt this quite strongly as I was praying and preparing for this. If you've been a Christian for many years, you will come to this manger scene every year. And what I sense the Spirit of God say is, you're here, but your footsteps are far from joyful. In fact, you're here because that's what we do at Christmas. You're here because you know you should be, but within you, you're going, I just don't feel joy. And I, I do believe today, and I had no idea Follow was going to have that as one of her prayer points, I believe that God wants to breathe some joy into some people today. And you know, that, I, I also think that will not be based upon necessarily your situation or your circumstance, but it'll be based upon approaching, kneeling, adoring, and worshipping the Christ, the newborn king. Because it is that moment, it is him, it is the power of God for those who believe that changes everything. I believe God wants us to have joyful footsteps. What I love about the shepherds and the wise men is that both of them didn't have a full theology. They didn't even have the completed word of God. But both groups of people saw a star or a sign or had a, a moment, an encounter with God. And based solely upon that, they responded. And my encouragement to us today is don't feel you have to have it all together. Don't feel you need to have a degree in theology. Don't feel you need to have all your questions answered. But when you encounter God, choose to put one foot in front of the other, joyfully, and come and worship. We join with the faithful, we join with the shepherds and the wise men, and we join with heaven. Sing choirs of angels, sing in exultation, sing all ye citizens of heaven above. Glory to God, all glory in the highest. After the shepherds were visited by the one angel, a whole host of angels came and visited. And they were terrified by just one, so imagine what they thought when a host of them came. I thought the, angel, the one angel might have said, guys, just to prepare, you were terrified when you saw me. Just so you know what's coming, there's going to be a whole host of heavenly angels appearing in a minute. But the angel didn't say that, because the Bible says, suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared. And what did they do? They praised God. They sang glory to God in the highest. I think there's a party going on in heaven. There's a party going on in heaven. Every time one person says, I believe this child is a newborn king. There's a party going on in heaven. At the announcement of Jesus' birth, heaven rejoices. And as we sing today, again I say it, it's not just us. We're joining with the heavens. We're joining with angels. Earth and heaven collides in this beautiful harmony of worship and adoration. And we get to join in it. Sounds like a party. And the great news is, you are invited. You're invited to be right in the middle of it, to be part of it. And the question we have is this, how will I RSVP? How will I respond? Throughout this carol, we're given multiple opportunities to consider our answer to that question. As we sing this refrain... I grew up in the Church of England, and we used to sing it in a certain way. And the music would quieten down, and often the female voices would sing. Oh, come, let us adore him. And then there'd be an extra layer that adds on top, and it might be the alto, the descant, or the male voice. Oh, come, let us adore him. And then everyone joined in and went, I've sang this too high. Oh, come, let us adore him. 
Christ the Lord. And it was brilliant. Right, quickly, have we got time? Have we got time? Let's, let's do a bit of karaoke, okay? You guys, you're the first line, okay? Then you guys add the second line, and then we'll all join together. So, oh, come let us adore. Fantastic. And you know, I think there's far more to musical crescendo and Christmas nostalgia going on here. Because that first line is almost like an invitation. Oh, come, let us adore him. And then the second line is almost like, well, what's my response? What's my intention? and it builds till everyone joins in and the invitation to adore becomes adoration in and of itself and the question is extended to you today this Christmas would you approach would you come and look and gaze upon this newborn king wherever you're at you're not alone you get to join with the faithful Join with the shepherds and the wise men. Join with heaven and join with one another, singing glory to God in the highest. You see, this Jesus came to earth, fulfilling hundreds of prophecies of the Messiah. He came to restore and to redeem. He came to rescue and love. He came in humility and humanity to offer hope and eternity. This Jesus grew, he taught, he healed, he looked out for the weak and helpless, the outcast, the broken. He was worshipped as king, but yet then turned upon, beaten, arrested, crucified and died. Then three days later, he rose from the grave. He defeated that which was seen as final, death itself and separation from God caused by sin. Through him, through Jesus, through this baby born in a manger, God says, I'm with you. And God says you're forgiven, you're accepted, you're restored, you're given life, you're giving hope, you're given future for now and forever more. And the invite is extended in, to you today, wherever you are in the room or online. Jesus says, why don't you come and worship? Consider the invitation, respond with your intention and let it come out as adoration. As we triumphantly and joyfully worship him as Lord. And with any invitation, you have to decide, am I free? This year, am I free to worship Jesus? Am I going to make time? Am I, do I want to? I've got more important things to do in my life. And then you might even be asking, what's the risk? What will people think if that's, if I declare that I love Jesus with soul, mind and strength. But I'd maybe flip that round to you and say, well, what's the risk? If you'd like to approach Jesus for the first time or or to recommit your life again to him this Christmas, I'm going to pray a simple prayer and I'd ask you to pray with me to say, God, I'm here to worship. And then we're going to declare and sing with all our hearts this great carol. Let's pray. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe that you were born into this world to show that, God, you are with us. Thank you that you died for me. Today, I receive you as my Saviour. I want a brand new start. Help me to live for you. If you'd prayed that prayer and you'd like to pray with someone this morning, as we finish today, there'll be people to my left and my right who'd love to stand with you, celebrate with you, and pray with you. But let's stand and sing, O come, all ye faithful.